welcome everyone. We're so pleased that you're able to join us this evening. And so our plan for this evening, we're going to be sharing and practicing lots of questions tonight. The conventional, traditional types of questions such as multiple choice. And we're also going to be practicing a lot of alternate item um, test questions. We're going to look at some smart study tips for NCLEX preparation. And also Angela is going to demonstrate how to locate those practice questions that you need to pass your nursing exams and the NCLEX. We're also gonna take a look at the NCLEX exam and the new COVID modifications that are starting on October 1st. We're going to talk about the NCLEX and your NCLEX goals for that very important exam. We're going to show you the components of the test plan and Angela's gonna pull up an actual test plan for you. And as I mentioned before, we're going to do lots of practice questions. We also wanna remind you at this time of an upcoming session that's going to be held on October 6th, so just a few weeks away. And that one is on mastering pharmacology and we know you're going to love that session. Okay, so on this next slide, we have some smart study tips. So first, while you're in nursing school, use your textbooks and NCLEX review books and practice questions to get ready for your nursing exams. Select those practice questions using the Evolve resources in your books and you can select questions based on body system or health problems. And shortly, Angela's going to share her screen and show you just how to do this. Now for your nursing exams and NCLEX prep, practice as many test questions as possible and always read the rationales and strategies. Practicing test questions is critical and we can't emphasize this enough as to how important it is um, to do this in order to get ready for your exams and the NCLEX. So on this next slide, let's just take a look at some of the top nursing resources and how you can locate what you need to do to be successful. So on the top left, we have the strategies book, which is for both RN and PN students. And this is really helpful in developing your test taking skills. And each chapter in that book goes into great detail about how to apply strategies as you answer test questions. And there are actually over 1200 practice questions in that book. And next on the top row, we have additional RN products and all of the PN products are noted below. The comprehensive review books are perfect resources while you're in nursing school to use during your courses and while you're studying for exams. They include content and well over 5,000 practice questions. And we'll quickly show you that table of contents in a moment. And then to the right is the Q&A book. And this book is all practice questions based on the NCLEX test plan blueprint. There's over 6,000 practice questions in these books. And these are different than the ones in the comprehensive review. So you get different questions in the Q&A book. And finally, to the right are the online review programs, which provide lots of content, lots of practice questions, audios, videos, and this, um, these programs will help you to put those finishing touches on the NCLEX prep. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Angela, and she's going to take a look with you at the table of contents. Great, thank you so much, Linda. Hi, everyone. So let's take a quick look at the table of contents. This is for the comprehensive review that Linda was mentioning. While you're in nursing school, you can read the sections that you're learning about. For example, if you're learning about maternity, you can review the outlined maternity chapters and then practice the questions that go along with those sections on Evolve, which is the electronic resource that accompanies the book. We do also want to point out that there are 13 pharmacology review chapters in the book that coincide with the content area or the body system. So ex for example, you have a cardiovascular chapter then followed by a cardiovascular medications chapter. So if you look at the table of contents here, you'll see 
Um, once you do get to those adult health units, you'll see how the medication chapters come after the body system chapters, which has been very helpful to students. And then on the next slide, we will show you the table of contents for the Q&A or the question and answer book. And as you can see, Linda mentioned, these chapters are designed so that they address and provide questions for each client needs component of the test plan, which is the way that NCLEX organizes the information on the test plan. So it's a really helpful resource as you're getting ready to take the NCLEX. The comp is really helpful during nursing school and for NCLEX, but then the Q&A based on and organized by these specific client needs categories is very helpful um, during that time period where you're really sitting down and focusing on studying for the NCLEX. This happens to be the evolved resources for the Q&A, the, the RN Q&A. Um, so if you click here on the study mode and then a um, couple ways that we recommend studying, especially during nursing school when you're studying for exams during nursing school, you then click health problem and then um, you can see here that it's organized. Here's adult health, maternity, mental health, newborn, and then pediatric specific. So let's just look at adult health here. And let's say you have an exam on cardiovascular, for example. Um, and let's say specifically your exam is going to be on heart failure and on myocardial infarction. So there will be 83 practice questions specific to those areas that you can study for for that exam. Students really like the ability to filter it down to that level. And I do wanna show you one more way to filter questions. Again, if you go to the study mode, which gives you practice questions with instant feedback, and then to content area. And if you go to pharmacology, then you can go by body system. Um, and then also you can go by drug classification. So let's say you're gonna be tested on anticoagulants. There's 44 questions for you specific to anticoagulants. This was something that students really were looking for and asking for. And so we were really happy to be able to, to do this because it seems to be quite helpful for students as they're studying for exams during their program. And then when you get, when you're getting ready for NCLEX, you can use this product and maybe not filter it down to that level and it would still be helpful for you um, but it, it is an option with this particular product um, and so we did want to just demonstrate that to you thanks angela and that was a great presentation of how to use that evolved site so thank you for that so now on this slide let's look at the modifications to the NCLEX starting October 1st due to the COVID-19 crisis. Now the NCSBN tells us just this past week that these will be in effect for a while and will remain in effect until further notice. So in your two far right hand columns, you can see what the original RN and PN test plan included. And what's significant to note on this chart is that for now, both the RN and the PN will be a five hour exam and will be comprised of a minimum of 75 questions and a maximum of 145 questions. Also, it's important to note that 15 of these questions are experimental or pretest unscored questions in the exam. The other um, point is that NCLEX has also reintroduce their NGN, Next Generation NCLEX Research Section, which is completely voluntary. And you will see this research section at the end of your NCLEX exam. They'll ask you if you would like to participate. And again, it's voluntary. However, we highly encourage you to participate in this very important research study because the NCSBN is collecting data for these new item types and they really need your participation and input. And the test remains as a computer adapt adaptive test. So that's an important point to remember also. Now, all of these changes that they've made from the original exams 
do not make the test more difficult. The psychometricians have found that they can validly and reliably determine competency with these number of test questions. And also we want to point out too that the CDC disease control guidelines are being followed in all of the test centers, including enhanced cleaning, especially between each test taker. So now on this next slide, we've listed some references for you to the MCSBN, and this is where you can find lots of additional information about the NCLEX. There's a wealth of information about the exam, testing centers, candidate bulletins, the test plans, and we highly encourage you to access the website on a regular basis, basis to keep, keep up with what's happening. Okay, so on this next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about, about goals, and I'm going to turn this over to Angela. Wonderful, thank you. So for those of you who are beginning or perhaps intermediate students or level one students, whatever terminology is used, you're at a strategic advantage because you have some time before you take the NCLEX and you can use that time to prepare for the exam at the same time that you're studying and preparing for your nursing exams and other requirements in the program. And so your goal really does need to be preparing for NCLEX while in nursing school. That's going to be very, very helpful to you. For those of you who might be level two students or higher level students, upper level students or seniors, everything that you've learned so far in class and clinical during your program, whatever efforts you've put towards preparation have been preparing you for the NCLEX. And so now your goal should be to put on the finishing touches. And we're gonna talk about these specific strategies in a bit, but the first thing that we wanna to talk to you about is the NCLEX test plan. And so if we look at this slide here, um, the test plan is very important to be familiar with. Why is that? Because it actually lists the content and activities that you as a newly licensed entry level nurse must be able to perform to provide clients with safe, effective nursing care. And so the test plan tells you what you're going to be tested on. How great is that? Um, and on this slide here, we have two examples of what are listed in the test plan. The first one is in the safe and effective care environment component of the test plan. We'll talk more about that component in a bit, um, but it tells you that you need to know guidelines for using ergonomic principles. So use ergonomic principles when providing care, such as safe patient handling and prop proper lifting. So that's a pretty detailed statement. The second one is from the physiological integrity component of the test plan and actually tells you the exact lab values that you need to know for the NCLEX. So lab values for ABGs, BUN, cholesterol, creatinine, glucose, hemoglobin A1C, hematocrit, hemoglobin, INR platelets, potassium, and so forth. Um, so again, very, very detailed information. So that's really helpful for you as you study. You should know the normal lab values for these tests so that you can recognize if a lab result is high or low, if it's presented in a question and what that value means with regard to the client and the question. As of now, you, you may not see reference ranges um, provided for you. Um, but they have NCLEX or NCSBN has recently started to have that discussion about including normal reference ranges in the exam. So you may or you may not see them, but either way, you'd, you'd rather err on the side of caution and be prepared for that and be able to interpret the significance of a lab value presented. And so with that, we highly recommend that you access the NCSBN website, you download the test plan, save it on your computer or print it out, use it as your study guide for the NCLEX, as you master each content area or activity listed in the plan, you should highlight it. And then once your test plan is all highlighted, then you should feel ready. Um, and so the link to access the test plan is here on this slide. And just be sure that you download the correct plan, the RN or PN plan, whichever one is appropriate for you. And I'm actually going to show you now a page that you'll come to and you'll want to click download publication. And this happens to be on page 14 of 65. 
This is the safe and effective care environment component of the test plan. Um, and you can see these are the activity statements here. These are the things that you wanna be able to go through and highlight um, by the time that you are done studying and getting ready to take the exam. Um, and they're pretty detailed. And in some areas, they're more detailed than others, but it really helps you. So they, they tend to be in boxes, these activity statements. We're gonna look at the levels of cognitive ability. So the levels of cognitive ability are remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, synthesizing, or creating. It's not at all likely that you'll encounter questions that address the level of remembering or understanding. Questions are written typically at the applying level or higher because the practice of nursing requires clinical reasoning and clinical judgment. This means that you'll be required to apply, analyze, and evaluate with regard to the information provided to you in the test question. You'll also be required to use the levels of cognitive ability of synthesizing and creating. An example of this might be creating um, plans of care or creating teaching plans for your clients. So let's take a look um, on the next slide at a sample question that addresses the level of cognitive ability of applying. A pregnant client tells the nurse that she felt wetness on her peri pad and found some clear fluid. The nurse inspects the perineum and notes the presence of the umbilical cord. What is the immediate nursing action? One, monitor the fetal heart rate. Two, notify the primary health care provider. Three, transfer the client to the delivery room or four, place the client in the Trendelenburg position. So you can go ahead and use the polling feature to answer this question. All right, so it looks like about half of you, 50% of you chose um, option four, and option four is actually the correct answer to this question. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into this. This question asks, what are you going to do? It's an applying question. It asks for an immediate action on the nurse's part to prevent or relieve the cord compression. So make sure you're reading every option. Consider reading each option more than once. The only action that is really going to achieve this is going to be option number four as far as relieving the pressure on the cord. Remember, if the umbilical cord is noted upon assessment, the nurse should immediately place the client in the Trendelenburg position while gently holding the presenting part upward to relieve the cord compression. This position is maintained, the, the healthcare provider is notified. And the fetal heart rate should also be monitored for any fetal distress, but positioning is going to be the immediate action in this case. The client would be transferred to the delivery room um, if, if and when um, that's indicated by the provider. All right, so moving on, we have listed the integrated processes. Um, so the NCSBN has identified five processes as components of the test plan that are considered fundamental to the practice of nursing. These include caring, communication and documentation, culture and spirituality, the nursing process and teaching and learning. What this means is that each test question will address one or more of these components. And so we can go ahead and look at a practice question that addresses the integrated process, teaching and learning. The nurse is caring for a hospitalized child with a diagnosis of viral pneumonia, um, describes the treatment plan to the parents. The nurse determines the need for further teaching when the parents make which statement regarding the treatment. One, we need to be careful since oxygen is flammable. Two, it's difficult to watch you insert the needle to give those IV fluids. Three, it's important that my child isn't allergic to the antibiotic that's prescribed. And four, the chest treatments will loosen the lung congestion, and so coughing can more easily clear the lungs. All right, so it looks like in this case, 35% of you chose the correct answer, which is going to be option number three. 
What you want to really be careful to note here are these strategic words that we have kind of highlighted here for you, need for further teaching. So these words ask you to select an option that is an incorrect statement. And you also do want to note the word viral in the question. And remember that therapeutic management for viral pneumonia is going to be supportive. And antibiotics typically are not given unless the pneumonia is considered to be a bacterial pneumonia. Oxygen, intravenous fluids, and chest physiotherapy are all appropriate interventions for a hospitalized child. All right, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Linda to talk about the client needs categories of the RN and PN test plans. Thank you, Angela. Now, this um, next slide shows you the client needs categories for both the RN and the PN test plan. Now, I know this slide looks a little bit busy, but all of this information is actually in your test plan, so don't feel like you have to write all this information down because if you do download the test plan, as Angela suggested, and as we highly recommend, all this information and the pre uh, percentages are going to be presented there for you. Now, the NCSBN identifies four major categories under the heading of client needs, and these are safe and effective care environment, your health promotion and maintenance, your psychosocial integrity, and your physiological integrity. And as you can see, some of these categories are further divided into subcategories, and then you'll see the percentage of questions for each, and it does vary by the category. But there are a few things that we want to point out, and then we'll provide you with some specifics about content you will be asked on the exam. And again, we're gonna show you some sample questions. So first, you can see that the safe and effective care environment and the physiological integrity categories comprise the highest percent for this exam. So you want to be sure that you're really strong in the management of care and the safety and infection control area. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, you're certainly likely to see lots of questions on trans transmission precautions. So be sure that you feel really proficient in the theory and the application of these principles. Also, because physiological integrity is a high percent, you're most likely to see lots of adult health questions. Note that the health promotion and maintenance and the psychosocial integrity are your lowest percentages. So you may or you may not have maternity questions, you may or you may not have mental health questions, but then again, you can. So be prepared for these areas because they are content areas in the test plan. And remember that everyone's exam is different because your questions are being pulled from an extremely large pool of questions that the MCSBN houses. Okay, on this next slide, we provided the percentage for the RN and the PN test for the safe and effective care environment and listed some, but not all of the content areas that you will be asked about. So again, follow your test plan. And as you know, management of care, coordinated care addresses content such as advanced directives, client rights, confidentiality and privacy issues, consents, assignments and supervision and prioritizing. And again, we want to emphasize here that the safety and infection control section focuses on all the safety issues as a priority. So this is really important to remember. And remember to be sure that you understand the concepts related to transmission precautions and how as a nurse you would apply these precautions. So on this next slide, we have an example of the management of care, coordinated care question. The nurse working on a medical nursing unit during an external disaster is called to assist with care for clients coming into the emergency department. Using principles of triage, the nurse would implement immediate care for a client with which injury? One, fractured tibia, two, penetrating abdominal injury, three, bright red bleeding from a neck wound, and four, open massive head injury 
resulting in deep coma? We'll give you some time to answer that. Okay, so it looks like 53% of you selected a bright red bleeding from a neck wound, and that is the correct answer. So great work. Now with these types of questions, whether it's in the emergency department or it's out in the field, think about the clients or the victims that you can save. The victim with the bright, the bright red bleeding, which means arterial bleeding from the neck wound, is an immediate need of treatment in order to save that client's life. You need to do something. The victim with a fractured tibia requires intervention, but there's no data in this question or in the option warranting immediate intervention. So this victim can wait a bit and can probably provide even some of their own self-care. Now the client with the penetrating abdominal injury would be classified as an urgent victim requiring intervention within 60 to 120 minutes, but not immediately based on the information provided here. And the client with an open massive head injury resulting in deep coma has a minimal chance of survival. So this client will be given supportive care and pain management, but is given definitive treatment last after these other victims are treated. Okay, on this next slide, we have an example of a safety and infection control question. The clinic nurse provides home care instructions to the mother of a child with a diagnosis of chickenpox about preventing the transmission of the virus. Which instruction would the nurse provide? One, isolate the child until the skin vesicles have dried and crusted. Two, ensure that the child uses a separate bathroom for elimination. Three, bring all household members to the clinic for a varicella vaccine. And four, request a prescription for antibiotics for all household members. So let's see what you do with that. Okay, so it looks like 81% of you, great job, have selected the correct answer. The correct answer is option one. And you wanna remember chicken pox is caused by the varicella zoster virus and transmission occurs by direct contact with secretions from the vesicles or contaminated objects and also via respiratory tract secretions. But it's not transmitted via urine or feces and that's why option two is incorrect. And the recommended preventative schedule for receiving the varicella vaccine is 12 to 15 months of age for the first dose and four to six years of age for the second dose. It is not administered at the time of exposure to the virus. And since it's a viral infection, antibiotics are not used to treat um, chickenpox. Okay, so now I'll turn it over to Angela to talk about the health promotion and maintenance category. All right, thank you so much. So you can see here that we've provided the percentage for the health promotion and maintenance category, which is six to 12% for both RN and PN. And some of the content areas, not all of them though, that you'll be asked about are noted here as well, which includes developmental stages and transitions. Um, so the growth and development concepts would be important. Um, the aging process, all normal maternity and newborn care, health screening and risk factors for disease, and the techniques of physical assessment. So be sure that you review all of those areas and then review, of course, the test plan for any um, additional content that may be in this area. And um, moving forward, we have a practice question focused on health promotion and maintenance. The nurse is percussing the anterior thorax and the abdomen for tones and expects to note dullness in which anatomic location? So using the figure here, decide if it's A, B, C, or D. All right, excellent. So it looks like 66% of you chose the correct answer, which is going to be option number three or letter C. 
Percussion involves tapping the body with the fingertips um, to set the underlying structures in motion and thus producing a sound. Dullness would be noted over the liver, which is located in the upper right quadrant of the abdomen. Resonance is the percussion tone that you would hear between the ribs. And remember that dullness on percussion indicates the presence of an organ, and that will also help you to answer this question. All right, and now we have provided here the percentage for you for the psychosocial integrity category. For the RN, that's going to be 6 to 12 percent, and for the PN, a little bit higher at 9 to 15 percent. Um, some of the content areas might include content such as abuse and neglect um, or violence, crisis, grief and loss and the end of life, depression and suicide to name a few, and we've listed more here on this slide as well. So now let's take a look at a practice question focused on psychosocial integrity. A client who is demonstrating delusional thoughts says to the nurse, terrorists are sent here to kill me. Which response would the nurse make to the client? One, no one's going to kill you. Two, the medication is making you feel like this. Three, do you feel afraid that people are trying to hurt you? Or four, what makes you think that terrorists were sent to hurt you? Good, so 57% of you chose the correct answer, which is option number three. It's most therapeutic for the nurse to empathize with the client's experience and to encourage them to express their feelings. Disagreeing with them or disagreeing with the delusions, such as in option one, may make them feel more defensive and the client may cling to the delusions even more. And so it's not therapeutic. Medication may be prescribed to prevent the occurrence of delusions, but it doesn't cause the delusions. And then encouraging discussion regarding the, de the delusion as noted in option four would be inappropriate and non-therapeutic. Okay, so on the next slide, Linda's gonna talk about the physiologic, excuse me, physiological integrity categories. Okay, thank you, Angela. Now on this slide, we've provided the percentages for the physiological integrity categories, and we listed some, but not all of the content areas that you're going to be asked about. We're not gonna read this slide to you, and we refer you again to the test plan um, for the specifics, but what we want to again emphasize is that physiological integrity is the largest component of the test plan, and adult health is a primary focus, focus but we do want to point out that you may also be asked about pediatrics, risk conditions associated with pregnancy, such as diabetes, preeclampsia, prolapsed, the prolapsed cord, placenta previa, and abruptio placenta. So be sure that you read all of the activities listed in the test plan. So on this next slide is an example of a basic care and comfort question. The nurse is inserting an indwelling urinary catheter. As the nurse inflates the balloon of the catheter, the client reports discomfort. Which action would the nurse take? One, administer pain medication. Two, remove the syringe from the balloon. Three, deflate the balloon and advance the catheter. And four, remove the catheter and reinsert a new catheter. So let's see what you do with that. Okay, so great job. 80% of you selected option three, which is deflate the balloon and advance the catheter, and that is correct. So when pain occurs during urinary catheter insertion, it's usually caused by the balloon being inflated within the urethra. So in other words, the balloon's not entirely in the bladder yet. So if pain occurs, the nurse needs to aspirate the fluid from the balloon and then insert the catheter a little bit further so the balloon can inflate in the bladder rather than the urethra. Now, administering pain med is really not appropriate in this situation. Removing and reinserting the catheter is unnecessary. It's waste, wasteful and also it increases the risk of infection for that client. 
Okay, on this next slide is an example of a pharmacology question in physiological integrity. And we want to point out that this is an alternate item format question known as a multiple response. And these are the questions that require one or more than one answer, thank you, <laughs> answer, and possibly all options could be correct. Currently, partial credit is not given when you supply some but not all of the correct selections. So you need to do exactly as the question asks and select all that apply. Now, NCLEX candidates tell us that they receive 15 to 17, even more, multiple response questions on their exam. And these type are very difficult to answer, but the NCLEX resources that we showed you and Angela presented on the Evolve site provide you with several hundreds of these types of questions. And in fact, all types of alternate item questions. So let's look at this one. Which medication instructions would the nurse provide to a client who has been prescribed level thyroxine? Select all that apply. One, monitor your own pulse rate. Two, take the medication in the morning. Three, notify the primary health care provider if chest pain occurs. Four, expect the pulse rate to be greater than 100 beats per minute. And five, it may take one to three weeks for a full therapeutic effect to occur. Okay, so now your answer here is options one, two, option three, and option five. So let's take a look at this. You did really well. Um, level thyroxine is a thyroid hormone and it's used to treat hypothyroidism. So that's an important point to remember. And the client is instructed to monitor his or her own pulse rate. The client's also instructed to take the medication in the morning before breakfast to prevent insomnia and to take the medication at the same time each day to maintain those hormone levels. Additional instructions include calling the primary health care provider if the heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute and notifying the health care provider also if chest pain occurs because this could mean um, overdose. The client is also told that full therapeutic effect may take one to, th to three weeks and that he or she needs to have follow-up thyroid blood studies to monitor therapy and to make sure that the client is receiving the correct dose. Okay, on this next slide, we have an example of a reduction of risk potential question in physiological integrity. A client is scheduled for a renal biopsy. To minimize the risk of post-procedure complications, the nurse reports which laboratory result to the primary health care provider before the procedure. Okay, so we have prothrombin time, 15 seconds, potassium 3.8 MEQ slash L, serum creatinine 1.2 milligrams per DL, and BUN 18 milligrams per DL. Okay, you guys did great with that. 58% of you selected the correct answer answer, which is the prothrombin time. I just want to make a point here. For the NCLEX RN, you're going to see a lab value, and then you're going to see a second value in parentheses with most of your labs. This is called the SI unit or value, and the reason it's there is because in Canada, lab values are reported in SI units, and Canadian graduates do take the NCLEX exam. You don't need to worry about BSI units or worry about learning them. Again, they're there for the Canadian nurses. Okay, so back to this question. Um, Post-procedure hemorrhage is a complication after renal biopsy, and if the, if the client bleeds, you would provide pressure to the site right away. So because of the risk of bleeding, the prothrombin time is checked before the procedure. The normal prothrombin time is 11 to 12.5 five seconds, so the value here is prolonged. The uh, values noted in option two, three, and four are all normal values. Okay, 
And then moving along to the next slide is an example of a physiological adaptation question in the physiological integrity component of the exam. A client admitted to the emergency department reporting severe radiated chest pain is restless, extremely restless, frightened, and dyspneic. Immediate admission prescriptions include oxygen by nasal cannula at four liters per minute, troponin, creatinine phosphokinase, and isoenzymes blood levels, a chest x-ray, and a 12-lead ECG. Which action would the nurse take first? One, obtain the 12-lead ECG. Two, draw the blood specimens. Three, apply the oxygen to the client. And four, schedule the chest x-ray study. Oh, excellent work. 91% of you selected option three, and that is the correct answer. You need to remember that the immediate goal of therapy is to prevent myocardial ischemia. Therefore, your first action would be to apply the oxygen because the client can be experiencing ischemia. The ECG can provide evidence of cardiac damage and the location of the ischemia. However, oxygen is the priority to prevent that further cardiac damage. And drawing the blood specimens would be done after oxygen administration and maybe just before or just after the ECG, depending on the situation. And although the chest X-ray can show some cardiac enlargement, having the chest X-ray would not really influence the immediate treatment that you would give to this client. Okay, so I'm going to turn this over to Angela so she can look at some alternate item questions with you. Awesome. All right. So the current RN and PN test plan both include multiple choice and alternate item format questions. You're likely very familiar with the multiple choice question in which there's four options and there's only one correct option. Linda pointed out earlier a multiple response question as well. And so now why don't we take a look at some of the other types. On this slide here, you'll see a figure question or an image question. So let's try to do this question now. The nurse notes this heart rate pattern, refer to figure, on the cardiac monitor of a client recently admitted with chest pain. The nurse would take which initial action? One, notify the primary healthcare provider. Two, initiate cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Three, continue to monitor the client and the heart rate patterns or four, administer oxygen with the face mask at eight to 10 liters per minute. Okay, so it looks like 48% of the group chose the correct answer, which is option number two. And again, this is considered an alternate item because it includes the figure. So first, look at the strategic word initial. The monitor here is showing ventricular fibrillation, which is a life-threatening dysrhythmia that requires CPR and defibrillation in order to maintain life. Although the primary healthcare provider must be notified, CPR would be the initial action here. Oxygen is necessary, but again, initiating CPR is of higher priority because it provides more than just oxygen to the client. Monitoring the client's necessary, but not as the initial action. Emergency resuscitative treatment must be provided to the client immediately with VFib. All right, so moving on, we have another alternate item called a hotspot. So let's take a look at this one. The nurse is assessing the apical heart rate of a client. The nurse places the stethoscope in which anatomical area? The directions will tell you um, to refer to the figure and then using the mouse point and click on the correct area. So, um, so the answer is going to be um, option D. The apical heart rate is best assessed by placing the stethoscope in the mitral area, which is located, and you can see this on the figure, in the fifth intercostal space on the left side of the chest at the apex of the heart. The aortic area is located in the second intercostal space, just right of the sternum. The pulmonic area is located in the second intercostal space, but at the left of the sternum. And then herbs point 
is located in the third intercostal space just left of the sternum. So remember the apical heart rate should be assessed for one full minute. That's another important point to remember. And the nurse should count the rate as well as noting its rhythm. And then moving forward on the next slide, we have a fill in the blank question. And these are questions that ask you to solve a calculation, such as a medication calculation or an intravenous flow rate, or even possibly a calculation of intake and output. These questions require you to fill in the blank with a number. And it's really important that you follow the directions provided with the question. If the question asks you to round to a certain uh, point, then that's exactly what you're gonna wanna do. If it does not ask you to do that, then type in the answer without rounding. If you do have to round, always round at the end, at the very end when you've done your calculation. Um, there will be a little box for you to type the answer in, and you need to only type in a number as your answer in the answer box. You don't have to worry about typing in the unit of measure such as milliliters. This will be there for you outside of the box. And so that also indicates the end unit of measurement that the, the calculation is looking for. The rules for rounding an answer are provided in the tutorial provided by the NCSBN, and they're also provided in the specific question itself. You also want to type in a decimal point if one's necessary. But if it's not necessary, um, what's not necessary is to type a zero before that decimal point. Um, also, you want to note that you will have an on-screen calculator to perform calculations, and we definitely highly recommend that you verify your calculations with that calculator. So let's take a quick look at this. A physician prescribes a dose of 200,000 units of penicillin G. The label on the 10 ml ampule sent from the pharmacy reads, penicillin G, 300,000 units per ml. How much medication in ml does the nurse prepare to administer the correct dose? Round your answer to the nearest 10. So we recommend that you set up this um, medication calculation using the formula on the slide, desired over available times um, the vector, which in this case is ML. There are other ways that it can be done as well, such as with dimensional analysis, for example. But you can see here how it's set up with the 200,000 units on the top, 300,000 units on the bottom times one ml, which comes out to 0 0.66, which you would then round to the nearest tenth of 0 0.7 or 0 0.7. So you could list it as either 0 0.7 or 0 0.7, and those both would be correct. All right, so moving on, we have an ordered response or a prioritizing question. These are prioritization questions that require you to rank the answers in order of priority. In this type of question, you're asked to number a list of nursing actions in their order of priority. After reading the information presented in the question, you must then determine what you would do first, second, third, and so forth. The unordered options are located in boxes on the left side of the screen, and what you would do is you would click and drag all of the options to the ordered response boxes on the right side of the screen. Specific directions for moving the options are provided within the question itself. And one tip to answer these types of questions is to visualize the scenario. And so to go over the answer to this question, so let's all read the question first and, um, and then I'll just go over the ordered responses. The nurse witnesses a child getting hit in the nose with a baseball. The nurse rushes to the child who's bleeding from the nose. In order of priority, what actions would the nurse take? Arrange the actions in the order that they should be performed and all options must be used. So if a nosebleed occurs in a child, it's important for first the nurse to remain calm and keep the child calm as well. Otherwise, the child can become agitated and it's difficult to get the child to cooperate with the necessary interventions. Next, the child should be assisted to a sitting up and leaning forward position to prevent aspiration of blood. The child should not be placed in a lying down position because of the risk of aspiration. Next, nosebleeds usually originate in the anterior part of the nasal septum and can be controlled by applying pressure to the soft lower portion of the nose with the thumb and forefinger for at least 10 minutes. And then if bleeding persists, 
cotton or wadded tissue should be placed into each nostril and ice or a cold cloth should be applied to the bridge of the nose. And in addition, if bleeding does persist, the healthcare provider needs to be notified and the nose may require packing by the healthcare provider. After the nosebleed has stopped, um, petroleum or a water soluble jelly may be inserted into each nostril to prevent crusting of the old blood and to lessen the likelihood of the child picking at the crusted lesions and restarting the bleeding. Repeated bleeding episodes that last longer than 30 minutes may be an indication for the need of evaluating for a bleeding disorder. And then finally, documentation of the event, the actions taken, and the child's response would be next. So moving forward, we show you a chart exhibit question. These questions, um, these are questions that come with an accompanying chart or an exhibit that you must refer to and read before you answer the question. In this type of question, you're presented with a problem and a chart or exhibit, plus tabs or buttons that you must click to obtain the information needed to answer the question. A message will appear to prompt you to click on a tab or a button. So let's look at this one. We have a client's chart, which you need to read, and then the question that asks about something in the chart. So looking at the question, the nurse is reviewing the assessment data on a client who's pregnant. Which assessment finding does the nurse recognize as abnormal? One, the appearance of striae. Two, pale oral mucous membranes. Three, secretion of colostrum from the breasts. Or four, spontaneous accelerations of the heart rate. So looking at their chart with their physical exam findings, you can um, try to answer this question. All right, so it looks like 78% of you guys chose the correct answer, which is option number two. So you wanna note that the question asks you to identify the abnormal data. You need knowledge of normal findings in pregnancy in order to answer this correctly. Think about what the normal and abnormal findings are that are listed here. The word pale in option two also will help to direct you to this option. Paleness could indicate anemia. Striae and the secretion of colostrum are normal findings during pregnancy and accelerations of the fetal heart rate are normal and healthy and indicate that the fetus has an adequate oxygen supply. Okay, so now moving on, we show you an audio question. These are questions accompanied by an audio clip such as breath sounds or bowel sounds. You will have headphones for these questions. You can adjust the volume and you can listen to the sound as many times as you want. So let's look at this. A nurse is assessing a client's breath sounds. What sound is the nurse hearing? Okay, so it looks like 63% of the group chose Strider as the correct answer. And so again, audio questions require you to listen to the sound before you're able to answer the question. Um, you'll be prompted to use the headset provided and to select the sound icon and you'll be able to select the volume button, adjust the volume for your comfort. You can listen as many times as, as necessary. Um, examples of some content that you may be tested on would be lung sounds, heart sounds, and bowel sounds. All right, so next we have a graphic option question. These are questions that present graphic answer options instead of text answer options. So you would have pictures as the options. As with all questions on NCLEX, options will be preceded by a circle and you'll use the mouse to click on the circle that represents your answer choice. So let's look at this question. A nurse is planning to insert a nasogastric tube. In which position would the nurse place the client for the procedure? And it would be one, two, three, or four. And it looks like you can do the poll for this question. All right, excellent. So it looks like 86% of you chose the correct um, answer, which is option number one. For this question, you would need to know the procedure um, for inserting an NG tube and thinking about this type of tube and its purpose, where its placement would be, um, and then looking at the options to best determine that the position would be high Fowler's. All right, and finally, we want to thank you for taking the time to spend with us this evening and we wish you the very best of luck in your program and on the NCLEX. We always love to remind our students to stay positive, to believe in yourself, remember that you can do this 
And with that, we hope that you stay safe and have a great night. Thank you.